Just a note before this episode. The following interview contains discussions of rape, sexual assault, domestic violence, and the graphic recounting of a truly heinous murder. Listener discretion is advised. It was 6am on March the 1st, 2000, when a neighbour of John Price noticed that his car was still in the driveway. It struck him as unusual. John should have been at work by six, and he wasn't the type to sleep in. John's supervisor noticed his absence too. He should have been there. And an off-handed comment John had made the day before made his co-workers feel uneasy. His employer decided to send someone to knock on his door, just to ensure everything was okay. It was just before 8am when a co-worker of John's, alongside his next-door neighbour, approached his red brick suburban home in Aberdeen, a small town in the Hunter region of New South Wales. They noticed almost immediately that there was blood on the front door. After thumping on his bedroom window, they decided it was time to call the police. At 8.10am, Officer Matthews and Officer Furlonger arrived at Price's home. His front door was locked. The two policemen decided to walk around the side of the house and break in through the back door. What they saw has been described as one of the worst scenes in Australian criminal history. A judge would later refer to what happened as beyond contemplation in a civilised society. But as police walked through what was clearly a murder scene, they found a woman, comatose, in the bedroom. They'd soon discover that that was as far as they would have to look for the perpetrator. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, exploring the world's most notorious cases by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In this episode, I'm speaking with Sandra Lee. Sandra Lee is a former assistant editor of The Daily Telegraph and the author of Beyond Bad, The Life and Times of Catherine Knight. Catherine Knight was born in Tenterfield in 1955. What was her father, Ken Knight, like? He was a gruff Australian man. He was father of many children, including her and her two brothers and her twin sister. But he was a quiet man. He wasn't sort of, you know, an outwardly ostentatious man. He lived a fairly austere lifestyle in the bush. And he was quite a strict disciplinarian. And how about her mother. What sort of relationship did Catherine have with her mother? She had a pretty close relationship with her mother. She had a closer relationship with her twin sister, Joy. Her mother was a bit of a firecracker personality-wise and very much like Catherine and would go off the deep end, you know, pretty quickly. So it was a household that was mercurial and occasionally volatile. But having said that, there was also quite a lot of love in the family. And when you say volatile, there were allegations of rape within the marriage and suggestions that that was something that was spoken about almost quite directly with Catherine. There was, and nobody can prove it. And Ken Knight denied it. And when I interviewed him, he denied that there was any abuse in the family. He said that it was, you know, it was a hard family. They sort of lived quite hard and harsh, um, but he did deny any allegations that had been put about him. And Catherine herself has suggested that she was sexually abused as a child. Now, the fact that in later life she said things that turned out to be very untrue obviously cast Mm. doubt on a lot of her narrative of her own life. Yes. But do you think that was true? No, I don't. Simply because it was one of her arsenals. It was part of her arsenal, the lies and making up stories and getting revenge. The psychiatrist who interviewed her during her murder trial years and years later, they had serious doubts about it, even though she had made the claims. Nobody could ever prove it. And her allegations were sort of taken with a grain of salt by some of the family members. Her younger brother, Shane, who I also interviewed, and her older brother, Barry, her half-brother, Barry, they all denied knowing about it. So whether or not it's true, who knows? Knowing her personality and knowing how she was so self-defensive, 
it's it would be difficult to understand that she wouldn't have been the standover merchant if that had happened. But who knows? You know, you you can't really make a judgment call on that. And what was Catherine like as a child? What was her personality? Well, according to Shane, her younger brother, she was very loving. She mothered him. She absolutely adored him. He said that when she was a young girl, she would like to pick up stray animals. They were never allowed to have pets at the home because they were pretty much farmers. But she would pick up stray birds or injured cats or injured dogs and take them home and and get them better and then have to let them go. But she was also quite a bully. She would, in at school, because she wasn't particularly bright, her weapons at school were her fist and her tongue and she would get into fights and she didn't have any compunction about sort of throwing her weight around. And when Catherine started sort of falling into relationships in early adulthood, what did those relationships look like? What kind of relationship did she develop to men? Fiery. That's the only word to describe it. She had a very up and down roller coaster relationship. When she got married in 1974, she had only had one boyfriend beforehand and that didn't end well. And then she married in David Kellett in 1974. She was only young. He was drunk on their wedding day. And uh, she drove to the wedding. She rode her motorcycle to the wedding with him on the back. And, uh, and he was drunk. And that was sort of like the course of their marriage. And it was up and it was down. Both cheated on each other. Her cheating was always payback for his. And it was a volatile relationship. And on their wedding day, Catherine Knight's mother is said to have given a bit of a warning to, to him in terms of her personality and her disposition. Yeah. What did she say? It was actually before the wedding day. It was when they got engaged. And uh, she said, you better watch her because she's crazy and if you do anything to upset her, she'll kill you. So the mother knew, you know, the personality of her daughter and gave fair warning. And Kellett just laughed it off and didn't think anything of it. But, it, you know, that night on their wedding night, he soon found out exactly what the mother meant. And what happened on that wedding night? Catherine was having sex. Sex was one of her um, tools in her weaponry as well. She would like sex and she liked to use sex as sort of a way to keep her men in check. She wanted to have sex a lot on her wedding night. She wanted to have sex at least five times because she said her parents had sex five times on their wedding night. So kind of a weird thing to measure your parents' marriage by, but that was what she did. And he was so drunk that he passed out after a couple of times and then he woke up in the middle of the night with her straddling him and strangling him. I think in the beginning they were madly in love. I I thought they were totally opposite. You know, the tall redhead marries the little short, dark person. But then they say opposites attract. Well, she was just a girl. Auburn, curly hair with glasses, much taller than David. And um, I hoped the best for them. I went to live with her and David in Aberdeen for a few months. And um, of course, I got to know her a lot better then. She was working at the abattoirs. She was lovely. She was very charming. (laughs) We got on very well, actually. Um, Most of the time that they were married, Cathy and I got on very, very well. There was always something about the family that I wasn't sure of. I just felt there was a roughness around the edges. She could be extremely happy. She'd walk around the house humming and singing, and then next minute she'd just fly into a, a rage. And that was sort of the beginning of, of violence in yes. their relationship. Uh, what what did the violence progress to? What did it sort of look like throughout the course of their marriage? With her, it became incredibly vicious. She was very vicious. She, uh, at one stage after they'd broken up and they got back together again, he had cheated and he got another woman pregnant and he left Catherine and he went with the other woman. She was pregnant at the same time with her first child. After the baby was only a few months old, she put the baby on the train tracks in Aberdeen. And one of the local men who was foraging along the train tracks saw the baby in a bassinet on the train tracks and reportedly went and scooped up the baby. Other locals at the time said, or and later said that they saw it happen. Catherine, that was a revenge at David, the the husband, to pay back him. Another time after that, they got back together curiously and uh, against everybody's sort of, you know, best impressions. They always got back together. They would have a massive blue. The language was shocking. It would turn the air blue. She would hit him. Uh, At one stage, she put all of his clothes in the bathtub and burned them and told him that, you know, that's for him being a rotten husband. She punched him, backhanded him in the car, 
another time when she finally left him in Queensland, it wasn't the final time she left him, but it was one time she left him, she, he came home from work and she'd cleaned out the apartment. There was nothing left in it. She'd taken everything except one old couch. So she was very vindictive and revenge was, a you know, she was a revenge payback person. And when she left that baby on the train tracks, I mean, that, you know, could be read as attempted murder to that to that child. What was done? D- did she have any sort of mental illness or was there a conviction? What happened there? No, the police were involved and she ended up going into a psychiatric unit and she was treated. But Later on that same day, before she ended up being admitted to hospital, Morissette Hospital, she was seen around the neighbourhood swinging an axe around her head and just behaving absolutely wildly, out of control, and people were terrified that she was going to do something. So she was admitted to hospital and she stayed there for a few weeks. And the psychiatric diagnosis at that time was that she had borderline personality disorder, which is not a psychiatric illness. It's not a mental disease, it's just her personality. And the psychiatrist at that point said that there was very little that could be done for her and because it was in her nature, basically. But she she got out of hospital and she reunited with David. He sort of had left the other relationship. They got back together and then the roller coaster volatile marriage resumed and was pretty much that way for the next eight and a half years before he finally left her. And she decorated their home in a very eccentric way. She had a few strange habits. What kind of things did she hang up around the home? Well, the house was like a mausoleum and um, there were animal skins, there were animal skulls, there were old traps, um, knives, uh, anything that was kind of gruesome and macabre would be hanging on her walls. Old things. She liked old things and she liked things that sort of were symbolic of death. One of the psychiatrists said it was sort of indicative of her obsession with death. And her next relationship was with another man named David. Yes. Did that follow a similar pattern? Very much so. And in fact, the violence in the second relationship, who was not, it was only a de facto relationship, they lived together more off than on, but they did share a house. But her violence in that relationship escalated. All of her partners were big drinkers. She wasn't a particularly big drinker, but she was a loud character. She was outgoing. She had a a very big personality and everybody knew her. Well, everybody knew the Knights of Newcastle. So their relationship began as an affair. They were both cheating on their previous partners. And in no time, that lasted about three and a half years, in no time it became very violent. And in what way did that violence manifest? It was basically when she got cross with a partner. If he didn't come home from the pub in time or if he sort of, you know, said no to what she wanted, she'd hit him again. She was very physical. One time he came home from playing darts up at the local pub and he was a bit pissed and um, she hit him over the head with an iron. And another time she stabbed him in the stomach with a pair of scissors and the probably the most extreme, apart from that personal injury, the most extreme that she got with him was one time, again, she was angry at his drinking and he'd come home from the pub and she said, I'm going to show you what I'll do to you next time if you do that. And she went out the backyard and he had a dingo puppy, eight weeks old, and she picked up the dingo pup and sliced its throat. So these are serious, serious crimes that she's perpetrating on these men. Why did they not, and I mean this is the classic domestic violence question and and obviously we don't want to enter into victim-blaming territory, but uh, did these men report it? Did these men report the violence that they were being subject to? No, none of them reported it to the police. They reported it to their friends who could see, you know, the scratch marks on their face or when she decked him with the iron, he had bruising all over his face, black eyes and he, he took off for the night. He, didn't, he went and stayed with his mother for a few nights and he had his workmate pick him up from across the road. And when the workmate picked him up to take him off to work, he looked at him and said, you look like you've been in a war. What happened? And he said, oh, it's bloody Kath again. Then that's how they would react. You know, it's bloody Kath. It's just her. That's what she does. And they put up with it. And you've got to remember back in the time, it was in the 70s and the 80s. And, you know, these are countrymen. These are simple country folk. They don't really have it in their own sort of um, personality to want to report it. They don't want to be seen as being victims of a woman. You know, it's kind of like, well, what do you think about me if I'm letting my, my wife or my girlfriend beat me up? It's kind of like there's a factor of embarrassment and a factor of, oh, we're blokes, we can take it. 
physically, was Catherine a big or a strong woman? In terms of the violence she's perpetrating, it's it's pretty serious. Was she someone who was quite strong? She was she was tall and she was not a not a huge woman, but she was not a slight woman. You wouldn't say that she was lean and sort of you know super. Much. She was she would have been a, a, a healthy size fourteen and tall. She was strong and she was known for her strength. You know she could chop wood. She could do anything that any of her husbands could do. And curiously, most of the men that she went out with, they were all smaller than her. Was she quite? Could she be quite charismatic? Because in order to get these men back. She clearly had, as you say, an arsenal of weapons that she used and sex was clearly one of them. Could she sort of turn it on when she wanted people to to do basically what she wanted? Yeah, she could. And in fact, everybody that I spoke to, I spoke to more than 70 people in Aberdeen about her and everybody said that when she was nice, she was absolutely brilliant. She was lovely. She would make things for children. She'd, you know, if you wanted to go to the doctor and you didn't have any wheels to get there, she would take them. She would make dinners for people. She was good company. She'd play bingo with people. She'd take, you know, people who were unwell or sort of down on their luck to the movies. So she was incredibly kind. So she had this dual personality. If people were being nice to her and if she liked them, she would do anything for them. But once you crossed her, that was it. You were in her sights. The next relationship she had was with a man named John Chillingworth. Uh, I believe they had another child, which was her fourth. Her fourth and her first son. And her first son. What was her relationship like with her children? What was she like as a mother? She was actually a really, really good mother. All of the um, men that I interviewed, so the the three who were still alive, they said that she was incredibly a good mother. They really, they loved how she was with their their children. They trusted her. And in fact, even Price's kids who had their own children, he was a grandfather, when they got together, they trusted her with their kids. So, you know, they couldn't believe that she had this capacity for violence and extreme vitriol. And yet, on the other hand, she could be so nice. It was when she was with John Chillingworth that she uh, cheated on him with John Price. What kind of man was John Price? Charming. A really top bloke. Everybody loved him. He was funny. He was garrulous. He had a massive network of friends and he was a real centre of a big circle of friendships. He was an incredibly good worker. His main flaw was that he was a drinker. He spent a lot of time up at the pub drinking. He was hard drinking, hard working, you know, which sometimes doesn't always run in line with each other. He was always the first at work, irrespective of how much he drank the night before. He would be up and he would be at work doing his job and normally the first one there. He was a bloke who loved the beer and the smoke, you know, in a sense that, and that's what he enjoyed, I think, initially in, in his companionship with Catherine Knight. And that's what it was all about. Didn't want to have too many cares in the world. And I think when Catherine came along, she filled in that final little gap. And he was a father too, didn't he? Yeah, he what had three he? kids. He had three kids and yep. she had four. And she had four. When they uh, lived together, were all the kids in the same house? No, because Price is two oldest kids, one was married and the other one was living with his girlfriend and then soon got married. Their youngest one lived with his ex-wife, Colleen, who he only divorced many, many years after starting going out with Kath because she insisted on it. And he had always hoped that he would get back with Cole. He loved her. He absolutely adored her. And he never gave up hope that they'd get back together. How old was he approximately when they got together? They were both in their late 30s. And when they started dating, did the violence return? Not straight away with him. He was madly in love with her for the first couple of years, crazy in love with her and their language and they would have verbal fights. They were, theirs was more of a roller coaster when it came to abusing each other and she'd call him all sorts of hideous things and he'd call her all sorts of hideous things. You know, the language really, it would make most people go, oh, geez, really? Do you have to? But that was how they rolled. You know, they'd have a fight and then they'd get back together. And they didn't really live with each other until sort of a few years into the relationship. She stayed in her mausoleum on the main road in Aberdeen and he had his own house that he'd built with Colleen, his wife, his ex-wife, around the corner. And so he would be there and when she came over to stay, she would bring their two, her two youngest children because her other two had grown up. In 1985, uh, they fought over Price's refusal to marry her and she decided to take some videotapes. What did she catch on those videotapes? He had taken a few things from the mine where he worked, old vacuum cleaners that he pulled out of a drag line 
and he had an old medical kit that had expired its use by date and that the work said, yeah, you can have that. Anyway, she took it and he took it home and he had it all at home and she was for three months she'd been filming these items and saying that he had stolen them from work. And basically it was payback. She was doing this and she said, I'm going to, she could have it over him with this evidence that she would say had been stolen. And of course, she ended up sending the videotape to the bosses. They had him in and he was sacked. And what was it payback for? What was she so angry about? She was angry because he wouldn't marry her and he wouldn't marry her because he didn't want her to be in the house full time and he didn't want her to have his house because he wanted to leave that to his three children. It was a massive asset and he wanted to leave everything that he'd ever worked for to his children and he knew by that stage that, you know, she had been quite vindictive. Everybody knew what she did to the three other partners before him. So there was a long record of what she could get up to. So, And he wanted to protect his assets for his kids. In terms of Catherine's financial position, was she working at this stage and did she have her own property that she owned? She had her own property. She owned, uh, she had bought that um, years earlier when she was married. She bought that, she paid that off when she got a compensation payout from the abattoir where she worked and she'd done a back in and so she was then on an invalid pension. So she was taking a pension every fortnight and she had a payout from um, her work and that managed to pay off her house. So she was financially pretty set. The relationship that she was having with John was notoriously violent and the friends around him knew about it. What was their advice and how did they feel about Catherine? Run get out of it. What are you doing, you crazy man? And every time they got back together, they'd be they'd be together for four months, five months, and it'd be fine. And then they'd have a big blow up. And, you know, she'd go back, he'd kick her out of the house, wouldn't let her back into the house. So she'd go back to her place. And then they'd get back together. They both really enjoyed a very healthy sex life together. And all of his mates said that was one of his big downfalls. You know, he, he he just liked the sex he was, and he was and he was a softy he was really a softy at heart and he wanted a, he wanted a woman in his life and she was the best that there was at the time how did the violence uh, perpetrated by Catherine escalate because she would sort of hit him as she had other partners and it continued to get worse and worse. Uh, Nearing 2000, how did it start to get worse? It got worse because she was angry that he wouldn't marry her. So about a year before she killed him, she began escalating. She asked her nephew to steal his car and burn it and throw battery acid in his face. The nephew said, no way, I'm not doing that. You know, that's crazy. Another time they were in the house, in Pricey's house, and they had an argument over the kids and over the house and over money, and she stabbed him in the chest with a knife that she had in her hand. And he bolted over the road to one of his mates and said, oh, my God, the speckled hen, look what she's done to me. And they said, mate, she's going to do a lot worse. You've got to get out. And, of course, they went back and they had sex that night and it was all on again. And all of his friends kept warning him. And his wife, Colleen, she warned him. She said, mate, he's going to do something to you. They were very close. Even though they divorced by this stage, they remained very close. And um, everybody said, you've got to get out because she's she's going to do something to you. So he knew. And was John himself aware, do you think, of how dangerous this was seriously becoming? Yes, he was. And uh, in the last few weeks of his life, he had warned his friends and said, if I don't turn up at work, call the police because she's done me in. All of his mates said, she will do you in. It's getting worse. They all knew about what she had done and what her capacity for violence was like. So nobody was Pollyanna here and saying, oh, you know, she's she's actually as sweet as pie. They all knew what she was capable of doing. And he ended up going and getting an AVO against her on the day that she killed him. So it was February 2000 when neighbours noticed that his car was still in the driveway and I think co-workers, you know, he didn't show up to work, which was a massive red flag for them. Uh, When they turned up to his house, there was blood on the door. They called the police. What did police find inside that home? An absolutely gruesome, macabre, evil sight. There's no word other to describe it than evil. She had had sex with him that night. She came ar- came around at about 10.30, let herself into the house. He was in bed asleep. She put on a black negligee. She went in and she initiated sex with him. And of course, him being him, pricey being pricey, they had sex. And then he sort of nodded off to sleep. And then she leaned under the bed and pulled out a knife 
and began stabbing him while he was lying on his back. And the poor guy, obviously, he's woken up. Nobody knows how many times she stabbed him initially, but it was several. And he managed to get out of bed. It's the flight or fight syndrome. He fled. He managed to get out of bed and he ran down the hallway and she was chasing behind him and stabbing him in the back, in the neck. He got into the entranceway into the lobby of the house and he was trying to get out the front door. He managed to open the front door and she was still stabbing him. She stabbed him at least 37 times. She inflicted massive damage to most of his internal organs and then he died. He, he basically, he was gone. He bled out and then after that, she took her time and she skinned him in one piece. So she used her skills that she had at the abattoir to skin him in one piece from head to toe, including his genitals. And then she put a meat hook through his head and hung him in the architrave between the dining room and the kitchen and then she decapitated him, and then she posed his body, and then she cooked his head. We got the call from his boss to say that he hadn't come in and somebody had been out there and the ute was still in the driveway and couldn't raise anybody. But, you know, not thinking the worst, oh, yeah, he's probably tied one on or something <laughs> and hasn't woken up. I went up, saw it, knocked on the door. Uh, didn't get an answer, saw some blood. Looked through a little gap into the lounge room, which was dark, and saw what looked like a bunched up curtain hanging down. Couldn't raise anybody, so I decided we'd go and break into the place, seeing as we had this complaint. I walked around the side, there was a piece of meat just lying on the, on the ground, and went round the back, broke in through the back door. As we went in, I saw straight ahead of me the um, what I thought was a curtain. There was something hanging, uh, blocking my entry into the hallway of the house. I, I thought it, it looked like a some type of blanket or uh, some sort of covering that had been placed up on the uh, on the archway. So I, I, I remember I used my left hand to push it aside and immediately I could feel coldness coming on my left arm. So I, I looked down and my left arm was just covered in blood. Initially I thought I'd injured myself breaking through the back door, so I couldn't understand why my arm was bleeding. I realised then it was a, a human pelt, it was the skin minus the head. A full skin just hanging from the, from the top door frame. Looked past it and uh, saw a torso on the ground without a head and without any genitalia. And uh, I think my first reaction then was to turn around to Scotty and say, don't look Scotty. Of course that's the worst thing you could say. I looked through, I could look through there, from there into the, the lounge room and I saw what appeared to be you know, a human being or what was left. And so it was at that point that I, I'd realised you know, what had happened. It was set up almost as though it was something she was going to serve. Yes. Do you think that was an intention of hers? It was. That was her intention. She cut off part of his buttocks and cooked that and she served it up with vegetables that had been cooked. So the house, the kitchen, was laid out as if it was going to be, you know, two meals. They were made for Pricey's kids and she left vindictive notes under the plates that had been served up as if, you know, as if your mum was just making you a nice dinner and you're coming home from school or you're coming home from work. It was incredibly nasty what she did. That was another element of her her personality, which all the psychiatrists said was just the extreme level of vindictiveness because she wanted to inflict maximum um, pain and hurt and humiliation on his kids as well as him. And she posed his body in a really macabre way. So everything that she had done in the house after their sexual encounter was meant to absolutely sort of shame him and to inflict maximum damage on everybody associated with him. Because how could you ever forget that type of, you know, evil? That's all it is. It was just pure evil and payback. What did the note say? The judge uh, has never released the notes to protect the children. So one can only imagine it was incredibly vile and nasty and, you know, at the extreme end of her capacity to inflict pain. What was the 
lasting consequences on those police? Because I'm imagining it from the perspective of a policeman or woman who has been called to an address because someone isn't answering the door. And then they walk into what's sort of been described as one of the worst scenes in Australian history that is so beyond imagination. What happened to those to those police officers? Well, they all had to undergo extreme counselling for post-traumatic stress disorder. Some of them still suffer to this very day. One of them could go back to work for months and months and months because he was so horrified by what he'd seen. Um, one of the forensic police officers who was there to do an accounting of the crime scene and to work out what had happened, he had to have counselling. These people all said it was the worst thing that they'd ever seen. And you can imagine, you know, they had to break into the house. Catherine had slept the night there. That was only after she went to his bank account in Musselbrook and robbed him of $1,000. So after she's done this incredible, brutal act of evil and crime, she's then had a shower, got dressed, got into her van that one of her ex-partners had bought her, drove 15 minutes to Musselbrook, and in two separate withdrawals took out two lots of $500 from Pricey's bank account, the money of which has never been recovered. Nobody knows where it went. Everyone has a theory, but nobody can prove where it went. That was at 2.32 a.m. and 2.34 a.m. that she did that. And that was only discovered months later when his best mate was looking after his will and his estate and he was going through the bank accounts. He thought, hang on a minute, on the 1st of March at 2.32, Pricey was dead where did this money go? And they put it together. She had stolen it. She drove back to his house, had a cigarette, had something to eat. All of this is amid a crime scene, blood everywhere, a dead body decapitated, a head cooking in a pot on the stove. And then she went to bed and she was found asleep the next morning by the police who broke in. What was her response when the police have, have walked in? She's there. Is There's no question about who has done this. What's her response to it? She feigned illness. She would pretended that she'd tried to take an overdose of pills. When she was in hospital later on that day, they were all within the proper therapeutic dose. So that was another sort of facade. And she had said to many of her family members and to friends that if Pricey was going to leave her again, she was going to kill him and she was going to make out that she was mad so she'd get away with it. So this was part of her ruse. She was doing it. The police roused her, took her out, and she's never admitted it. Not once. She pleaded guilty but she has never admitted it and she's never explained why she did it, though it's pretty obvious that, you know, she didn't want him to kick her out and she didn't want to leave. Catherine had gone and driven some substantial distance to the, the uh, township of Musselbrook where she withdrew $1,000 from John Price's bank account by way of using his key card. And then after, after all that, returning to the crime scene. She was trying to plead insanity and she told her brother that she's going to kill Pricey she said, I'm going to kill him. And she said, I'm going to get away with it. She said, I'm going to do it in the way to make him think that I'm crazy. And her brother had actually made a statement against her about her saying that. She told him three weeks before she murdered Dad. Is there any sort of insight into why it might have been that this is a woman who perpetrated violence across so many years of her life, why it was that night and it was that person that she decided to kill? The basic bottom line is that she'd had enough. She'd had enough of having men leave her. She didn't want him to leave her. She decided that payback was part of her nature. It's, it was in her DNA. And her whole modus operandi was revenge. So Price, he wanted her out of the house. He wanted her gone. She didn't want to go. And if she couldn't have him, nobody could have him. What happened when the court case began and there's that, uh, you know, she's pleaded guilty. What was the conviction? She's the first person or the first woman in Australian history to be jailed for the term of her natural life. Her papers were marked never to be released by Justice O'Keefe. He said the crime fell in the absolute worst category ever. It was so depraved. It was so violent. It was so premeditated. This was not an act of a crime of passion. You know, it wasn't her just picking up a knife and going, oh, and killing him by accident. It was not a manslaughter. It was premeditated. She'd thought about doing it for days and days and days. She knew how she was going to do it. She lured him with the sex and then she committed this barbaric, heinous defilement of his body afterwards. She's the only one who's been, the only woman, jailed for life. 
Was there a psychiatric assessment that took place during that process? Yes, there were three psychiatrists who spent many, many hours with her in the jail, talking to her and asking her different questions and why she did it. To all of them, she said she doesn't remember. All of them said she has borderline personality disorder, which is, as I said previously, is not a psychiatric illness. It's just basically that she had rage. She had rage issues, she had anger management issues, and she had desertion issues. If people were going to leave her or kick her out, you know, she didn't want that. She wanted she wanted her way. Catherine Knight is still in prison and yes. she's still alive. What do we know about her life now? Initially when she was in prison, she was working in the governor's office. She's never going to be working in the kitchen, clearly, because of her love of knives and sharp objects. She's either a fairly okay prisoner, she doesn't cause many problems, but apparently she does lord it over other prisoners and she's been known to say, you do know what I did to my husband. She's quite proud of what she did, really. When I asked her to be in, well, I wrote to her and asked her to for an interview and it was a really um, ironic letter I got back from her lawyer and the lawyer said she doesn't want to be interviewed by by anybody for this. She's done the interviews with the psychiatrist, all of which I've seen. But his response was that she doesn't want to sully his name, John Price's name. And you, you just think, how ironic, you know, that's another stab, excuse, no pun intended, at him with what she'd already done to him. This case is one that is uh, notorious in Australia because of its gravity and how awful it is. And also, I suppose, it sheds a light on a relatively rare occurrence as opposed to the other way around of domestic violence perpetrated by women upon men. What do you think this story tells us about women who kill and violence when it comes to women? Because often the narrative is quite different around it, I suppose, how we interpret it culturally. We do. And culturally, we don't want to believe that women have this capacity for violence. And clearly they do. Her capacity was such that she even threatened her daughter that in prison when she was visiting that she could kill her in jail. So, you know, this this woman is violent. She is evil. She has standover merchant qualities. She is a really bad piece of work. And she's not the only one. There are a lot of women who have a capacity for violence and we just don't want to accept it. Many psychiatrists, many law enforcement authorities, they see it all the time. And, you know, it's it's just that we always think that, you know, women are the nurturers, we're, we're maternal, we're supposed to look after other people, we're supposed to look after the vulnerable and the weak and the needy and babies. And, you know, some women aren't like that at all. They have this enormous capacity and she had it. We also have a way when it comes to women and crime of sometimes retrospectively placing a narrative about how they were a victim who became a perpetrator. So yes. it's almost we, we want to search in the history and suggest that there isn't any inherent evil or in, inherent psychopathy, but that it's something that they were driven to do mm. be, because of their experience. But it would seem that Catherine Knight was a woman who almost had that in her from from childhood. Well, she did. When she was a kid at school, she walked around with a knife down her boot. And at one stage, there were a couple of boys across the road leering at her and a couple of her girlfriends. And she went over the road and threatened them with the knife. And that was when she was a teenager. So she had already displayed this incredibly aggressive nature. It wasn't something that was everybody else who was there at the time looked at her and go, geez, Kath, what are you doing? You know, where did that knife come from? And even some of her friends were worried about her. They were frightened of her. So she had a long history of violent, you know, tendencies. It wasn't something that just came out of the blue. It wasn't something that just manifested itself because, you know, one of her boyfriends or her husband had pissed her off in that moment. This was part of her nature, and it still is part of her nature. I would be very worried if I was in a prison cell with her. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. When I was interviewing Catherine, you can catch someone's eye and you say to yourself, I'm being bullshitted to you. It's a combination of catching their eye, catching the expression on their face, that you know that this person is feeding you only what she wants to feed you. And... That's why I still believe that Catherine would now be able to provide information as to what took place and why it took place. 
She'd shown no remorse. She had not acknowledged that she had any problem at all. Such a person, if released, is not unlikely to do the same again. Sandra Lee's book, Beyond Bad, The Life and Times of Catherine Knight, is available at all good bookstores and online. To get your hands on a copy, just click through via the link in the description of this episode. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens, and produced by Elise Cooper. You can contact us with the cases you want to learn more about by emailing us directly at truecrime at mamamia.com.au.